This is the Canon R8, and this is the Canon R7. And if you mainly shoot wildlife photography, and you're curious what the difference of the two cameras are, or which is better for wildlife photography, well, let's talk about it. So recently, Canon introduced the Canon R8. And a year ago, they had the Canon R7. Both cameras are priced the same. They're both $1,500. And I've gotten a lot of questions about what is the difference in these two cameras and which one should I choose for wildlife photography, especially if I'm just first starting out or I want this as a second camera to my Canon R5 or whatever else you have in your bag. Uh, initially, it was not going to review these two together because they are completely different cameras because one is a crop sensor, the R7, and one is not a crop sensor, which is a full frame with the Canon R8. So to me, they have totally different uses and purposes. And then we'll talk about that here in a little bit. To me, as I said in previous videos, I think the Canon R7 really was more of an experimental camera. They were going to release a crop sensor at some point, but they took the opportunity, I think, to do this experimental camera because on the back, how you have the, die, the little jog wheel with the joystick and where some of the button layout is and, and things like that. To me, this really was an experimental camera. So let's throw some stuff out there, see if it sticks and see how people like it. And then coming to the Canon R8, even though it is the Canon RP body, the top button layout, where everything's sitting as far as your shutter, your top dial, your on and off switch, your stills video switch, I think that's probably going to become the basics of what Canon tries to do on the top of the camera because it looks like they keep sticking to this setup and I kind of like it except for one thing which we'll talk about when I get to things I don't like by these two cameras. And I believe this is really where they're going to go as far as how they have the layout. So I think this is their more traditional style on the top button and some of the buttons. And this was more experimental, which I do like some of it, but it is a little different when you get to using the camera from day to day. So the big difference on these two cameras is IBIS, in-body image stabilization. The Canon R7 has it, the Canon R8 does not have it. And if you watch any of my videos, you'll know the answer to that question for me, is that needed for wildlife photography? Remember the word needed. Uh, no. It, is it useful? Yes, it's useful if you shoot super low shutter speeds, which I usually do not. I subscribe to that uh, focal rule of if you shoot a 500 lens, don't shoot less than 1 500, so that way you don't get motion blur or shake or things like that. It's just kind of a, one of those rules, like the rules of thirds type things. But if you do shoot super slow all the time, you're shooting at 1 100th, 1 200th, 1 50th second, which I almost never do then yes, you'd probably want IBIS to attenuate that. And why do I believe IBIS is not that needed? Really, if you want to get the stop of a bird with his wings and its motion, then you raise your shutter speed to match that to get the stop. Because remember, stop comes from your shutter speed, not from IBIS. IBIS is going to help you with your shake and a little extra motion at times. But it's not something that's going to be, I have to have IBIS in my body. Because we didn't have them until we had the Canon R5 and the Canon line. So prior to that, we did not have IBIS in the body. So we were fine without it. So that's my thoughts on IBIS. Next, we'll get to the EVF. The EVF is a little better on the R7 versus the R8. But it's, it's really not that noticeable. If you go back and forth through the cameras, you can see it. But it's really not that bad. You can see everything you need to see and your subject and everything in the R8 just as well as you can in the R7. Uh, of course, the R7 is just a little bit brighter, a few more dots, a little more resolution, but it's not that noticeable. As far as the LCD, the LCD on the back is exactly the same between the two cameras, no difference. As far as the feel of the two cameras in your hand, uh, like I said in the R8 review videos, I'm only going to review that with the battery grip because I believe if you don't have the battery grip on this camera, it, it just feels bad and it, the battery life's not good at all. But with this R8, with the battery grip, this camera feels just as well as any pro-level camera because it feels really good in the hand to me. And it's light. It's actually lighter than the R7, even with the battery grip. How does the R7 feel in the hand? Um, I have this small rig cage on it, and I didn't feel like taking it off for this video. Um, that really, to me, helps a little bit with the depth of the grip a little bit, so it feels a little better here, but it still has a problem with my pinky trying to hang off the bottom of the camera. Uh, and with that, with the feel, when I have this on a big lens, my big 500 lens, which I'm holding, you know, like this all the time, this camera feels 100 times better in the hand. Even with being the smaller depth here, I kind of like it. So it's easier to hold in my hand like this than the R7 is because I kind of start to wear out the, the, this part of the palm of my hand with the R7 if I'm hand holding this a lot during the day, if I'm holding it for long periods. 
so there is that. So I really, to be honest with you, I like the feel of this camera with the battery group in my hand over the R7. And that's just my personal preference on the feel of the two, that. So let's talk a little bit about button layout difference in these two cameras. They are completely different because then the R7 was more of experimental. This is more traditional in some aspects. As far as the dials on top, like I said, I prefer the R8. Reason is it's the same as all my other cameras, the R5, the Z9, even the A1, things like that, they're the same. You have a dial up top here where your index finger is, and you have one by your thumb, which is another dial. And they're right there, the same place. On the R7, you have this little jog wheel here at the top, which I did like, and I still do like the, the feel of this, but it's different than all the other cameras. That's the only reason I would say I'd prefer this, because it's, it's, it's more natural to your brain, your, your muscle memory. But when I pick up the R7, I've shot it so much over the last year that as soon as my thumb goes to where normally this dial would be on this camera, that's where the on-off switch is on this one. So I feel that notch there. I know it's not it. I know to go to the, my brain just says go to the left. My finger, muscle memory goes to the left too. So I'm right there. Which leads to the next thing. This camera does have a joystick. This camera does not have a joystick, which I like on the R8 that is. And the reason I say that is, if you've watched my videos, you know I hate joysticks because I'm always moving my focal point where it doesn't need to be because I always bump it, especially on my Z9 and my R5. I would bump it all the time. The R7, I don't bump it as much because it's in the middle of that dial. And even what happened yesterday with my Z9 was I was trying to get focused on a bear, I needed, and he was in a tree, so I needed to hit the spot focus. But my spot focus is the bottom left because I apparently kept bumping that joystick and shoved it all the bottom left, so I had to bring the focus point back up where I want it, and then get my shot. So I prefer not to have joysticks, or I usually remap them. I need to remap my Z9 so I don't have that happen again, so I don't move my focus points around. But I prefer not having a joystick, so that's why I kind of don't care that this R8 does not have one. Uh, talking about other switches on here, let's talk about the video still switching on these two cameras. And I will have to give this to the R7 placement. One thing I really like about what Canon's done is before to get to video, you had to change this top mode dial from, you know, from manual to custom, whatever you're on, over to video to get your video settings going, uh, your program video settings. You can always hit the red button on top, but that takes you to auto setting, which I, we're not going to get into right now. But they've actually just coupled that top mode dial switch for record over to a physical switch on the camera. And I really, really like that, especially for me, because I go from video to stills constantly with these cameras. Which camera do I give it to as far as that goes? I give it to the Canon R7 over the R8. Why? Well, if I'm using the R8, I do like that it's a separate switch. I wish they'd do something over here on the, the all the new cameras where it is a separate switch, but put it on the right. The reason I don't like the Canon R8 is on the left. Why? If I'm hand holding and I've got my 500 prime here, I've got the camera up like this, I have to take my hand off this side or I have to somehow get my hand over to the left side of this camera to switch it to from stills to video. So I have to move. So if I'm locked into something, I need to change it. I've got to somehow come here or hold this whole thing rig up and get over here or find my way to get my hand across to that side to get it. And when I do that, I'm losing what I'm focused on here. With the R7, it's all right here at that same thumb. All I do is my thumb off the ISO dial over here to this and slide this all the way over to video with one switch. So that's why I like the video switch needs to be on the right instead of the left. So I think that's where they did fail a little bit. And I do like that it's a separate switch. I really like that. But if I'm not on a tripod or if I'm hand holding, this is a little extra work than the, the Canon R7 is. So I'll give it there. Everything else on the front of these is the same except for the Canon R7 has a little switch down here to switch your camera from autofocus to manual focus. For us uh, wildlife photographers, not a big deal. Uh, it is really cool. That way you don't have to go in the menu or on the lens and do stuff. You can just do it right here and you, you're switching from an auto to manual. Ooh, that was a tongue twister for a second. And you don't have that on the Canon R8. Uh, I feel like this is more for uh, landscape guys or portrait people like that. It's not as much for us doing uh, wildlife, but it is a difference in the two cameras. The Everything else is pretty much the same on these two cameras. Uh, 
except for the EVF. The EVF is a little better than the R7 versus the R8, but you won't notice a difference in the two. You'll, you'll notice if you go back and forth to them, but there's no degradation in this on the EVF to see your subject, get focus on your subject, or to see everything you need to see in the viewfinder to get your subject. Uh, and the LCD is exactly the same with both cameras, exactly the same. Another big difference on these two cameras is the memory card slots. So the Canon R7 has two SD card slots and the Canon R8 only has one. Again, as I said before, I don't shoot redundant. I probably should, but having only one card is not a big deal on these two. So now let's talk about batteries and battery life on these two cameras. So this is an LPE 6NH battery. This is the LP17 battery. This amp hours per one battery is about half of what the battery on this one is. But again, I wouldn't use this camera without using this battery grip. So by having two batteries in here, it pretty much matches this, ba this the battery life on this camera, which is really good. But the, this camera does not have a battery grip. Nobody makes one for this right now. If it did, then this would win over this one. But right now, that makes the battery life on these two cameras pretty much even. So that lens compatibility, all the lenses, EF and RF, if you have the adapter, work great with these cameras, just like always. But I thought I'd just go ahead and throw that in there so people are worried about, hey, does this lens, that lens work with the R8 and the R7? They all work with it. If they're an EF and RF lens, they work great with these cameras. So real quick on the autofocus of these two. This one is a more advanced autofocus system because the little white box will always track the subject of the eye wherever it's at. But whenever you hit the focus button, both these cameras lock on instantly fast what they're locking onto and they both stick to it. So as far as acquiring the autofocus and sticking to the subject in autofocus, they're pretty much the same. Watch, you'll notice on the R8, you'll have a little, like I said, you have the little white box, track it all the time. Both cameras, you can turn the subject tracking or subject to detect on, which means when you're, it's on and you've got two animals next to it, when that's on, you can have a little arrow that says, okay, don't go to this one, go to that one. Because we'll see both of them, but it's tracking one of them but you can tell it to track the other one. That's really what the subject tracking on is for. But like I said, you'll see a white box here, you won't see a white box here, but both of them are exactly what I'm, my end point of these two cameras is. You're always gonna be able to hit your subject with both cameras. If both if one's gonna miss, the other one's gonna miss. If one's gonna hit, the other one's gonna hit. That's what I'm getting to. So they're both pretty identical on hitting it and tracking it and staying with it. That's my use of these two cameras, what I've found out with these two. Now let's talk about the sensor of these two cameras. We have a 24 megapixel full frame and a 32 crop sensor. And what does that mean? Well, a crop sensor is more cropped in. We'll talk more about that in a minute about what a crop sensor is and all the advantages and disadvantages of that. But right now we'll talk about that is this would normally be an 80 megapixel sensor. So 24 versus 32 or 24 versus 80 will also mean that you'll have better low light performance with this one. It's really not low light, it just means you have more noise in this camera due to it has more pixels. And now that you're shrinking into 32 out of 80, per pixel you're gonna see more noise per pixels, why, why it is, with versus crop versus full frame. So it's not that there's more noise, it's just that you're zooming in more on the, the, the pixel, basically. So that's why you see more noise here in the crop sensor when you will the full frame. But again, not a big deal with our modern uh, stuff that will come in and clean those images up with DxO, Topaz, all those other new programs that come out, even Lightroom now has it. Now let's talk about the sensor readout speed of these two cameras. And what does that matter? Well, the sensor readout speed is going to be about your rolling shutter with these two cameras. So the R8 has a 14.5 millisecond readout and the Canon R7 has a 31.5 millisecond readout. About double the difference in these two. So what does that mean? Well, with the R7, if you're halfway panning across something low, you've got some straight lines in the background and you're moving fast enough, you will see the trees or the straight lines bow. With the Canon R8, at the same speed, you probably won't see very much bow. If you move it really fast, yes, you'll see some lean because it's always gonna happen with any camera, even the fastest uh, backside stacked ones. If you really whip it hard, you will still see a little bit of bow. Now, the difference of these two when that goes when you're just shooting without whip panning, you're shooting straight. Any little bit of wiggle movement sometimes will cause a little bit of rolling shutter in here. And what you'll see is a little bit of stretch or warp in your image. Now, a lot of times when that's happening, unless you have two competing images to look at right next that were taken in succession burst, 
you may see it a little bit, but if you just look at the one image, you're probably not going to notice it. What you will notice on this one with really fast birds is you will have wings that were one's down and one's kind of curled. You'll see the curl in it, and you'll know that's the rolling shutter. Now, birds do do this at times when they're turning, but uh, with the R7, you're going to see it a little exaggerated. I did catch it the other day with this one just a little bit, but not as bad as this one was doing it. But with that being said, in the burst, you'll see out of maybe you get 80 frames in there, you may say five or 10 shots and there may have something weird on something really fast, you're whip panning, uh, but you won't see as many. You may get one or two if this one, if that, on the RH. So the rolling shutter is worse on this camera than it is this camera, that's a, that's a given. And one of the big ones that got me with the R7 where I kind of got mad at it one day when I was shooting the uh, Sandhill Cranes, and they were taken off and I was shooting them taken off and I had a lot of images I could not use. The bird looked okay, but the trees were completely bent the wrong way. I mean, they, it, was, it was really bad where you could, it really threw the image off because the trees were, I normally don't shoot um, birds when they're that close to the trees in the background where I can really see the lines on them. I really want that blurred out. But I was sitting with these sand hills and they took off and I wanted to get the shot at the same time and that's, I had no choice in my background, but that on the R7 did ruin the pictures, which very seldom happens, but it did in this case. And probably had the R8, it probably wouldn't have ruined them as bad. It probably still had a little bend, but not as drastic. And, and I'm probably showing you those images right now. So they did irritate me a little bit because they're really cool takeoff shots because I caught them running and flying out of there. Now let's talk about the biggest difference of these two cameras. One of the reasons why I say these are different cameras, different uses in the field, and different types of cameras, why most people say, hey, go with the R7 to do wildlife. And that is the crop factor of this camera. So the Canon R7 has a 1.6 times crop, because it has a crop sensor in the body, and the Canon R8 just a one. There's no crop factor. So now you can put it in crop mode, but now you're at eight megapixel image, so you're at eight versus 32, so you can already see the advantage there. And the reason we want a crop sensor is that way we get more megapixels on the animal or the bird or whatever it is at the same distance where you're sitting from your subject as you would the full frame versus the crop. The image is going to be bigger, more pixels on the bird. So what does that mean as far as our focal range that we were talking a minute ago? If you put a 500 lens on this camera, it's going to have an effective focal range of 700 millimeters. If you put a 500 millimeter on the R8, which is full frame sensor, it's still going to be 500 millimeters at effective focal range. Now, even though we've got a more longer focal range where it makes the animal bigger in our subject, our depth of field is still the same on both cameras. The effective focal range on this camera is 700 millimeters with a 500 millimeter lens, but the depth of field is 500 millimeters. On the Canon R8 with the 500 millimeter lens, 500 focal, 500 depth of field. Now, why does that matter? Well, if they're both at 500 millimeters effective focal range, and what does that mean? That means I have a 500 millimeter lens on this one and I have a lens set to 313 millimeters. Because remember, 313 times 1.6 now puts me at 500 millimeters. So the bird in the frame will be the exact same size on both cameras, be that size. And we're both at 500 millimeters, so that's our focal plane. So the bird's gonna be the same size. Now our depth of field on this one's gonna be 500, and this one's gonna be 313. So let's explain real quick what depth of field is. Depth of field is the start and the end of the acceptable in focus range, and dead, middle's the dead center. And that range is affected by three things. One is the focal range of your camera, how long or wide it is. It'll be the distance from your subject to the camera. And the third one is your aperture of your camera, what aperture you're shooting. So to make the most narrow plane of focus, what we like as wildlife photographers, is you're gonna shoot the most wide open, your lowest aperture you can set in your camera, a larger focal range, and closer subject. So the closer the subject is to you, the longer your focal range is, and the more wide open you shoot, the more narrow that field of plane gets. When you want that plane wide open, another example is you shoot like a 15, 16 millimeter lens, you focus on a mountain way out there, now your subject is way off, you're, and you're, you open your aperture up to f11 or whatever, and you've got a smaller focal range, now your focus range is, quote, what they call infinity, where it's pretty close in front of you all the way out to your subject, the, the hill you're shooting. And so that's what it is. If you shoot 18, 15, 35 millimeter, 
farther subject, wider depth of field, a longer lens of 500, 600, subject closer to you, shooting wide open f4, f8, f5.6, it's going to narrow that focal plane. So now back to our scenario, these two cameras, both sitting at 500 millimeters effective focal range. So that's 500 millimeter depth of field, 313 millimeter depth of field. So how big is that depth of field now if I have a bird sitting at 60 feet from me? So on this camera, my depth of field is going to be 1.6 feet. This camera is going to be 4.2 feet, much larger. And at the back end of that depth of that focus plane, the front end of it, it falls off slower. When it's tighter, it falls off faster. It gets quicker blur on the edges of it. And as you see in these images of the black oyster catcher, that's what you're seeing here. You'll see that the ship behind this black oyster catcher is really blown out with the R8 and not as blown out with the R7. And then when we get closer to the bird, what you'll notice the background of the R7, you'll notice you'll see a little more uh, shapes in the back in the bouquet, but in the R8, it's almost a complete blur. And then I shot down on the same bird where you can see that the focal plane that you can see that's in focus in the rocks in front and behind it is larger with the R7 and not as large with the R8. So that's what depth of field does with these two cameras. So you have to keep that in mind that you're going to have a larger focal plane with this. Now, if you get that bird within 20 feet of you on both cameras, this thing's not going to matter as far as your depth of field because it's getting really narrow. You're talking about maybe an, not even an inch with this one if you're at 20 feet with the same 500 millimeter focal range and 313. And this one here is probably uh, probably two inches, three inches. So it's really, you know, it's really getting narrow there when you, you get, the whole thing is if you can get the bird closer, it doesn't matter. And, but with the effect of focal range, that's how depth of field is going to affect you. So you have to watch out for that. Now let's get to which camera should you choose if you've got to choose between two and you only got $1,500 in your pocket between the two cameras. And this is my opinion. Remember, go out and test and run these cameras yourself. And in my opinion, which of these edge out? If this is a backup camera to your Canon R5, your Canon R6, or R6 Mark II, which one of these two would I choose? It's going to be the R7. I would choose the R7 of that. Why? It's because of that crop factor reach. You already have a full frame camera that can shoot the full frame image at the same focal range as your lens. But by having this in your bag, you've got the same subject. You can now fill the frame up more or you can reach up farther, like with the Merlin video. The full frame, the bird was just too small. There's no way I could do anything with it, even cropping in. But by using this, I filled up more of the frame. Didn't have to crop a lot. I could get video and stills out of it quite well. So that's why I would go with the R7 over the R8 if it was my backup camera to my R8, R6, R6 Mark II. Now, this is your only camera. You only got $1,500 in your pocket. Which camera should you choose? It's a tough one. I would still say the R7, again, because of that crop factor, because of that 1.6. Now, you have to remember depth of field, and you also have to remember about your background. So if you only have this camera and never had this, you wouldn't notice that blur, blur and bouquet that you're trying to capture. But also just kind of work your angles, kind of try to separate, separate your subject from the background, which means you want it closer to you than the background, those type things, to get better bouquet isolations on both sides. But yeah, I would give this edge out just because of the crop factor there. Now, the caveat is that is if you're shooting a lot of birds in flight that are closer to trees, like you're shooting a lot of wooded areas, you're going to shoot things in flight, or you're shooting in a more urban environment where you have a lot of straight lines, this made the camera for you over this one, even losing the crop factor, because if you're moving a lot, panning it with a lot of straight lines, you have more acceptable images out of that than you have out of this due, just due to the bowing if you're moving fast. Now, with that said, both scenarios, I said the R7 to me wins out for wildlife photography due to that crop factor getting closer and more megapixels. Both these cameras are fantastic for wildlife photography. I did not expect this to perform as well as it did when I took it out in the field. I was really genuinely surprised with it. Uh, so even when I was shooting those birds that were two to four inches long, now I was able to get closer to them because I worked hard to get closer to them. But I even cropped in where I cropped out 40% of the image, so I had 60% left of the image. And it was still really acceptable, good feather detail, good, good image still left over, which really surprised me. Uh, again, I had to get closer, fill the frame up to do that. But this camera was really good, and it feels much better in the hand to me than this one does with this battery grip. Again, get the battery grip if you get the R8. But 
yeah, that's my opinion, my suggestion. I think the R7 for wildlife photography wins out in both scenarios if this is your only camera or your backup camera. But this camera is fantastic. So if only all you have is the R7 and you finally save up enough money and you want a full frame to do more wider stuff or with the rolling shutter at times, then pick up this R8 with this battery grip. It, it's, it's fantastic. And as always, guys, if you enjoyed this video and you're liking all the other videos, please like, subscribe, share. Watch the videos all the way through. That's one of the best things you can help with the algorithm for the channel is to watch it all the way through. And uh, if you want to help out monetarily to help us, you know, do things more like buy more gear, make more trips. Like next weekend, I'm going to go down more on the Kenai Peninsula down in Cook Inlet and see if we can get some more shorebirds. This time, hopefully, plovers and uh, turnstones, things like that, maybe some eagles, stuff like that. Uh, think about becoming a member of the channel. It's as low as a dollar a month, and that just helps us, like I said, buy more gear, put gas in the truck to get down there, hotel stays, things like that while we're out in the field. And until the next episode, guys, go ahead and get out there and run that shutter.